few quick announcements here. Uh, so a little bit going on next Sunday. First of all, if you are a member of the church, uh, we have our annual congregational meeting, and you'll get, be getting your leadership updates. And uh, if you're not a member, if you're a visitor, we invite you to go to Bolden Hall for CCPC 101, and that's next Sunday, so please join us. A reminder again of our South Dakota mission trip coming up in July. That's the 23rd to the 31st. Please go to our website for more information or to sign up. And next week, there uh, Sunday mornings will be a new 9 a.m. adult ID class. So please feel free to join for that. I'm going to call Paula up for an announcement. Okay. Uh, as with winter weather, we're always subject to uh, change because of temperature. Um, we have to cancel the Venture Crew Church uh, outing at Nine Mile next Friday because it's too cold. <laughs> Rick and I do not want to teach uh, cross-country ski lessons at zero. So we have rescheduled it <clears throat> uh, for February 19th. It's a Saturday night. Um, hopefully the temperatures will be better and maybe a little bit more snow. And the good news is uh, the Marathon County has said they're having free uh, trail passes all day Saturday the 19th and Sunday the 20th. So it wouldn't cost anybody anything except to rent equipment. So we'll see you on February 19th, uh, probably 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Uh, Bob and Melanie Hawker will lead snowshoeing through Nine Mile Forest and Rick and I will be teaching cross-country ski lessons to those who would like to join us. Thanks. Morning, everyone. Uh, Kari, I believe, spoke to you last week about the auction that is coming up, and that is going to be March 5th through the 12th. Just as last year, we're going to have it all online. It was so successful, and I think people really enjoyed having that whole week of being able to bid and outbid others. Um, and so we're gonna continue that this year, but this year we're gonna bring back the in-person element to close out the week. So on the 12th, we're gonna have a reception and gala. So what that means is at five o'clock, we will have a time where you can come in and actually look at the items and we'll also have hors d'oeuvres and desserts. For that part of the evening, we ask that you please sign up at the hub and get some tickets or you can RSVP on our website Reason being, we want to know how much food to have, um, but it is free. And then at 6 o'clock, we will be having kind of our uh, gala, kind of like we did online last year, if those of, you, those of you who watched, a little bit of entertainment, a little bit of fun, kind of closing out with the big bids. Um, that'll happen at 6 o'clock, and that is on the 12th. Uh, if you have items that you'd like to donate we're still looking for those, and you can do that either online or you can stop at the Hub and we have forms to fill out. You can bring those in at any time, but we need those donations in by February 10th, if you can, please. All right, so again, that's March 5th through the 12th for the online bidding, and then on the 12th, we'll end it with an in-person event. Uh, so with that, uh, we ask that you all prepare your hearts and minds as we come together and worship today. Good morning, church. Good morning. I thought of a new game to play on Sunday mornings. I'm going to hide the candles around this room and see if the acolytes can find them. It's going to be great. All right. Uh, our call to worship comes from Psalm 8. Please join me. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, 
the moon and the stars that you have established. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him but a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. Oh, that's your part. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's stand and sing. that all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. We have incredible freedom in Christ, but we have sometimes used that freedom to return to slavery and sin. As a repentant people, let's come to God in prayer. Holy Spirit, we know that our bodies are temples for you that we have not lived according to that knowledge this week. Instead, we dishonor you by dishonoring your temples. We have sinned outside the body and sinned against the body itself. Forgive us, Holy Spirit, for our sinful choices. Grant us the wisdom to spurn the shackles of sin that masquerade as freedom and sanctify us again as homes wherein you are pleased to dwell. No sin can match or exceed the grace of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. For if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. This is the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Amen. Come on up for the children's message. Let's sit up here on the top. 
hop step. Come on up for the children's message. Uh-uh. Of course. Well, hello! I feel like I haven't been here forever. It was like Christmas, right? Well, we had a lot of fun while I was gone, and then we had some not so much fun, and now I'm back, right? So one of the things I wanted to talk about today was um, as we grow our faith, we um, learn patience. <laughs> um, one of the things that helps us grow our faith is when we tell of what God is doing in our lives. And that has kind of a fancy churchy word. Have you guys ever heard of the word testimony? Yeah. Yeah. Heard that word? You have heard that word? Testimony is kind of a word we use in the church, and it tells us that what God is doing in our life, Right? So when we share about what God is doing with our life, it's called our testimony. Testimony kind of reminds us of what? The old or the new in the Bible? The Old tes Testament, right? The Old Testament or the New Testament, right? And so that's kind of where we get the word testimony. And so one of the things that I would like to rem that I know where God has worked in my life, when we went on our little vacation... Miss Amanda has probably told half of the people in the room how worried I was about our flights and getting on an airplane and driving to get to the airplane and all of those things. Because guess what? It's winter, right? And it snows. You know what happened? Not one snowflake. Our flights were on time. We didn't have to sit. They were smooth. There was no bumpiness. It all worked out. And you know what? I think God had a lot to do with that. He reminded me during that time, Amanda, I've reminded you not to worry. And I've got it, right? He controls, he, he's in charge of a lot of things, right? And he helps coordinate and orchestrate things. And so that was something that was really, really cool for me as we drove to get on our airplane and drove to come back and all of that, it reminded me that, you know what, God even cares about those little things in our lives and those things that we worry about and things like that. And so for me, that is one of the places that I saw God this last month. And so I want you guys this week to think of a place where God is working in your life, okay? Think of a place where um, you see God doing something, even if it's something you're worried about or maybe it's a friend at school that you're sharing, God, sharing about God with or something like that. And so think of where God is working in your life. And then here's the thing. I want you to tell your mom and dad about it, okay? Tell mom and dad or tell your sibling, hey, this is where I saw God work today. So maybe that's a good dinner conversation for this week. Does that work for you guys? Yes? Okay. That sounds good. So as we grow our faith, as we reflect on the good things that God does, we'll, um, we'll say a prayer and then we'll head down for kids' worship. So, dear God, we know that um, you are in our testimonies. We want to give you glory and credit for the things that you do in our lives. And we know that even in the little things like travel or, or spending time with friends or family or going to school, that you care about the things that we care about. And God, we just want to reflect back and say thank you for the things that you do for us and, and recognize where you're in our lives and what you're doing when you work in our lives. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for this day. In your name we pray, amen. Okay, so if you are third grade or younger, you can head down to kids' worship. And fourth and fifth graders, if you want to stay up with your parents, that would be great. If you haven't checked in, go see Mr. Jeff, okay? Go around. All right, as our kids head off the kids' church or back to their seats, this is a great time for you to please stand up and turn and greet your neighbors.
All right, our Old Testament passage this morning comes uh, in a couple of places in the first two chapters of Genesis. We're going to be in uh, the first five verses and then verse 31 and a little bit of chapter 2. So just, I, I think these are pretty familiar words, but just as a reminder, uh, the first chapter of Genesis is the story of the seven days of creation. And on the sixth day, God makes Adam and, oh, well, rather, God makes men and women. Uh, and then the second chapter of Genesis is a different creation story um, where we get the stories of Adam and Eve. And we're going to read a little bit from both of those stories as we think about God's role in um, creating particularly us. So listen for God's Word. Uh, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. We get several more days of creation, and then God reflects on what He did in verse 31. God saw everything that He had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Uh, and now we're going to pick up in that second creation account in chapter 2, beginning with the second part of verse 4. In the day that the Lord God made the, heaven, the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Let's continue to worship.
Our New Testament passage this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. Uh, Paul is um, writing to the church in Corinth. They have um, massive issues, okay? Uh, Corinth is just a, um, they're a church that's close to Paul's heart, but they got a lot of issues. And um, one of the <clears throat> many challenges they're facing is this confusion around the issues of sexual morality. Uh, And basically, um, they have taken these little pithy sayings that Paul and probably others had used um, to talk about the law, and they've applied them in a context Paul didn't imagine. So you're going to hear, actually, as we read, you'll even see on the screen, like the first line of verse 12, in quote, says, all things are lawful for me, end quote, but not all things are beneficial. So that first bit is a quote right, that either Paul said previously or others have said, and Paul is re-quoting. Uh, and almost certainly Paul said this in the context of some of the Jewish ceremonial laws, right, where Paul is saying, you don't have to follow all the rules about what you eat and drink anymore. Um, and the folks in Corinth have taken it and applied it in ways he didn't imagine they would ever do. Uh, so you'll hear Paul's um, quoting of those phrases and then his response to them. Listen for God's Word. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with Him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you were bought with a price? Therefore, glorify God in your body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have been, over the last few weeks, talking about this idea of identity, of vision of ourselves, and trying to think about some biblical categories of identity that I think both in and outside of the church we've kind of lost track of. And so uh, I've got this graphic, um, we put that image up, that comes from Dallas Willard, and he talks about these different um, components of who we are that Scripture speaks about. And at the core of of our personhood, uh, the very center of that series of circles, it says spirit or heart or will. So we began talking about the heart, not as the source of our emotions, but in the biblical understanding, the heart is the source of our choices, right? It's where um, we have the ability to decide what we want to do. And we said that at that most central component of our identity, we are who we choose to be. And then last week, we talked about mind, and we said the mind, at least in the biblical worldview, is is both thoughts and feelings. And we said we don't have control over our thoughts and feelings like we do over our choices, but we can manage them. And we said we are what we choose to think about. Today, we're going to talk about body, and in fact, because I think we are so confused on this topic, we're going to spend a couple of weeks talking about uh, the component of body and how it relates to our identity. Um, so uh, you, can, you can take that off for a minute. So I, I want to think about um, a theology of the body that I think has been lost. And before I get to what I think we should believe, I'm going to start with what I think we already believe. I think there are really two big ideas or big ways of thinking about our bodies and our identity that are most common in our world. And I could... Um, explain how these ideas go all the way back to Epicurus and Plato, and maybe we'll get to them later. But I think there are some philosophers even better than Epicurus and Plato to explain these ideas to us, okay? So one of those philosophers is a, is a famous one you know um, called Madonna, and one of those philosophers is a band you might know called The Police, okay? 
So um, I want to play um, the first philosopher, uh, a woman named Madonna, and her perspective on um, our bodies and how they relate to our identity. So we'll just play that little clip. I'm like trying so hard not to dance Um, because that would really be memorable but in the wrong kind of way. Um, So uh, material girl, right? We are material girls. Um, This is the simple idea that this world is all there is, right? The physical world is all there is. And so um, you got to enjoy it while you can because you're not getting anything after it, right? And I think this is a pretty common philosophy in our world today, right? Um, I don't think that's as much a Christian philosophy. I think Christians, um, we, we often fall into the second error that um, I think the police explain for us so clearly. Can you play that clip? Okay, um, boy, isn't this how we often think about ourselves, our bodies, and our identities? That, oh, I'm a spirit that inhabits this body, but it's not really me. The real me part is this spirit or this soul that animates my, my flesh, right? The flesh isn't really me. Uh, so, if we wanted to go back, we would say the material girl philosopher, that Epicurean idea from you know, Greek antiquity is that there is nothing but the physical, right? Materialism or physicalism. Maybe we could say matter and energy is all there is. And then the police, right, which kind of connect to Plato, is this idea that there is a spiritual world that's real. There's a little bit of spiritual stuff in you. All this material stuff is going to go away. It's not really important. Only the little bit of spirit in you is all that matters. And I want to suggest that both Madonna and the police are wrong, right? Pretty profoundly wrong. Uh, and that there is a different philosophy that Scripture speaks about. We're going to spend today talking about it, but in broad strokes, Scripture tells us that our bodies relate to our identity in two really important ways. First, um, that our body is an inseparable part of who we are, and second, that our bodies are good, okay? So our body is an inseparable part of who we are, and our bodies are good. God made them good. Okay, so uh, stay with me because I want to I want to unpack that, and I want to go all the way back to the very beginning. Actually, I want to go back to before the beginning. So we know that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, um, but but before that is an interesting time. We don't have a lot of scripture that explains to us what was going on before creation, but we know one clear thing, right? That that God is around before creation. That that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit exist before creation. And um, something really weird happens on day one of creation because God makes physical things. He makes light and, and I mean, light's energy and a particle, whatever, but it's, it's a physical thing. It's part of creation. And God likes the light and He says it's good. This is really strange. So um, it's really hard for us to do this, but, but imagine for a moment that you lived in a world um, like God did, right? You lived in this spiritual world where there is nothing physical, right? God is spirit, not made of matter or energy or dark matter or dark energy or any of that stuff, right? God is spirit. And all of a sudden, um, He makes this physical stuff that's never existed before. Now, God makes angels. Okay, sure, that makes sense because they're spiritual beings, right? They're like God in the fact that they're not made of particles and waves. And, but, but then He makes physical stuff, and it's weird. Why is he doing this? Um, I, uh, I, this week, I bought my first cryptocurrency, which is just a weird thing, and I can… it's weird. Um, and and I've, I've got a buddy who's been pushing me to do it, and I keep saying, well, we already have money, right? So why do we need crypto? Because we already have money. Um, and I kind of think this might be how the angels… Um, would have looked to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit and said, wait a minute, why are you making physical things? 
Like we already have the spiritual world and it's better and it doesn't get old, it doesn't get tired, it doesn't die. Why would you make physical things? But God's like, no, no, this is going to be cool. Watch what I'm going to do. So, so God makes um, the light and he makes the sky and he makes the dry land and the fish and the birds and the animals and all this stuff. And, and he makes everything and he says, wow, I am really excited about this, right? It's good, it's good, it's good, it's very good. And on the last day, right before he says it's very good, he makes people. Uh, And then, um, jump ahead to the second creation story in Genesis chapter 2, we get this really interesting moment where we're told um, that God breathes into the nose, the nostrils of the person he makes from the ground. Um, So this is verse 7 of chapter 2, then the Lord God, Yahweh God, formed man, um, Adam, from the dust of the ground, and Adama, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Okay, uh, that's uh, neshmat, uh, neshmat chaim, the breath of life. And the man became a living being, a nefesh chaya. Uh, so I, I, we got to spend a little bit of time in Hebrew here because it's going to help us, even though um, I know it sounds ridiculous. Uh, so do me a favor, will you say uh, neshmat chaim? You got to sort of chaim, like you're going to, it's going to be gross at the end of it, okay? Neshmat uh, chaim. It's chaim. It's there you go. That's great. So neshmat uh, is a Hebrew word that means breath or spirit or wind, okay? Sometimes we have another Hebrew word called ruah, which means the same thing, and we could have a whole sermon on those two words, but not this sermon. Uh, so neshmat chaim is, is the breath of God that gets breathed into the nostrils of the body that he's formed from the dust. And then we're told the, the body becomes a nefesh chaya. Say nefesh chaya. You guys are great. Okay, love it. Um, so uh, the, the word nefesh is the word translated in our NRSV as being, right? Chaya means living, but, but nefesh is translated as being. But that's not a great translation. Usually the word nefesh means soul, okay? So every time in the Bible in the Old Testament, almost every time, that you see the word soul, it's this Hebrew word, nefesh. So something really interesting happens. God breathes something of Himself, His, um, his neshma, into the body, and the body becomes a living soul. This means two really important things for us. Uh, The first is, and we're going to spend a whole week on the soul later, but just go with me. The first is that your soul is not a part of your body. Your body is a part of your soul. Okay? Are you with me? Um, There's the body, and there's the neshma, and then when they come together, it makes a nefesh. It makes a soul. Your soul doesn't live in your body. Your body lives in your soul. Okay, your body is part of your soul, at least in the Hebrew theology. Um, even more important, um, we start realizing the, the, the role of humans in this new, bizarre, material world God has created. Because we got the spiritual world over here, right? We got where um, God and the angels exist, and we've got the material world over here where there's, I don't know, dogs and cats and fish and stuff. And then God makes humans, and He says, ah, you're going to have a foot in both worlds, right? You're going to have a foot in the spiritual world, and you're going to have a foot in the physical world, and and you're not just one or the other. You're not a spirit pretending to be physical. You're not a physical being wishing that you could have a spiritual experience. You are both all the time. You are the bridge between the first spiritual stuff and this new physical stuff, right? This, this is kind of incredible. So when, when God made us, He said, um, I have this incredible plan. You're going to bring together everything I made. You're going to bring together the spirit and the physical. You're going to bring together the animals and the angels, right? You're going to bring it all together in you, humans, because you're like me. So this idea uh, that, that God makes us um, and our bodies are part of our identity is overwhelmingly important for us, right? We, we are not... Um, Platonists, or, or um, we're not the police who believe that we're a soul that God made and then drops in a body for a period of time. Right? We, we come to life, our soul comes into existence um, when God's Spirit and our body come together. 
And uh, when God does that, he says, this isn't just good. This is very good. I love what I am doing. I love what I have made. I love what I've done with you. You are spirit and you are flesh and you are good. I think we really struggle with this. Uh, I think we struggle with, with both of these realities, right? Um, we struggle with the reality that my body is part of who I am, and we struggle with the reality that my body uh, and, and my, my physical, spiritual reality is a good thing. And, and we see this in all kinds of ways. Um, I, I came across a story about uh, a girl named Kitty Wallace this week. Um, Kitty Wallace is a, a woman who grew up in England, and um, she shares her story of um, her overwhelming self-consciousness. Um, so uh, in the report, it said that Kitty Wallace remembered very clearly the first time she felt there was something horribly wrong with her face. She was eight years old in her downstairs bathroom with a friend as they washed their hands before dinner. She says, I just remember looking at our reflection and thinking how different I looked to her. At that moment, I had this very strong feeling that my face was offensive or disfigured compared with hers, and then a sudden realization that this must be as obvious to everyone else as it was to me. Uh, the belief in the wrongness of her own face grew stronger and stronger. By the time she reached her teenage years, it was all she thought about, along with an acute paranoia about public humiliation. She uh, says, the fear of people noticing how deformed I was, of being made fun of, was overwhelming. It was like everyone was looking at me and judging me. Um, what she didn't understand was that she was suffering from um, body dysmorphic disorder, um, which is uh, uh, an illness that makes us look at ourselves as though there's something profoundly flawed about ourselves. She struggled with this for years. Um, she said that uh, when she was a teenager, she would get up at 5 a.m. every morning and spend two hours on her makeup before she could leave her room and go down to breakfast. She says, quote, I'd eat breakfast really quickly, run back up to my room to check my makeup, go to class, go back to my room to check my makeup, always checking, 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 that I'd managed to hide how disgusting my face was. I couldn't let it slip for a minute. It was exhausting, and I was desperately lonely. Let me show you a picture of Kitty Wallace as a child. Um, will you put that image up? Um, that is a cute kid. Right? Um, there's nothing wrong with her face, um, but she has been convinced uh, at this incredibly young age that there was. Um, will you put up a picture of Kitty Wallace today? Um, now she's a beautiful young woman. And Kitty is involved in helping people in England who have body dysmorphic disorder um, come to some realization about who they are. Um, but she says it's been a lifelong struggle for her, right? There's literally nothing wrong with her, right? But she's convinced that something about her body isn't good. And, and I think Kitty's experience is an extreme version of a lie we've all heard and even told ourselves. Right? You can take the picture down. Thank you. Um, We've, we've told ourselves that something about us, especially about our bodies, just isn't good enough. That we're not smart enough or pretty enough or fast enough or funny enough. Uh, and and um, boy, that maybe we could fix it if we just got the right stuff together, if I just got the right makeup, or if I just had the right cosmetic surgery, or if I just ate the right food or stopped eating enough food, or if I, if I just convinced people uh, to look at only the pictures on my social media feed that I wanted them to see and never anything else, um, that maybe eventually I'd start looking or feeling better. Uh, and, and this idea that there is something wrong with me, something wrong with my body, um, something broken about me can lead us to terrible places, uh, as can this idea um, that my body is just something that I use, right? Something that I inhabit and enjoy for a while. Um, this leads us to, uh, as Paul talks about in Corinthians, to sexual encounters that cheapen ourselves and cheapen others. It uses us, leads us to drugs and alcohol, to workaholism, to not getting enough sleep or uh, not uh, eating enough food or eating too much food. Um, it leads us um, at some point, sometimes like Kitty, to really profoundly dislike who we are and, and even like our body and what it looks like. 
to the point of, of body dysmorphic disorder or um, surgeries to change how we look or um, eating disorders or cutting or suicide. And all of that is rooted in this lie um, that our bodies aren't us and they're not good. So today, you got to help me put aside Madonna and the police, okay? Um, you got to help me in your own life to say, I, we need to be reminded of this fundamental truth uh, that when the God who made you looks at you, He thinks, I knocked it out of the park, right? And, and yes, some of you may be balding, right? And I'm really sad for those of you that's happening to you guys. That's really sad. But um, uh, some of you may say, hey, there are legitimate things about me I don't like. Um, but God looks and says, it was never the amount of hair on your head or the shape of your nose or how much you weigh or don't weigh that I liked about you. What I like about you is that you look like me. That, that you reflect me to the world, that you are this bridge to bring together the spiritual and the physical, right? What I like about you has nothing to do with anything that you've ever worried about or that you could ever lose or ever gain. So uh, this, this incredible message um, for us, uh, really, really simple, um, that um, God made you, your body is part of you, and it is good. Now, uh, let, me, let me say this. Uh, I want to be really careful that this doesn't come across as just a positive self-image sermon, right? I am, I am for positive self-image. That's great. Um, and, and I don't want this to be just uh, don't do drugs and sleep around sermon, though you shouldn't do drugs and you shouldn't sleep around. Um, because there's, there's more to this unpacking of, a, of our, the significance of our bodies and our identities than just those two things. Uh, Come with me to 1 Corinthians for a minute. So in 1 Corinthians, Paul makes this incredible metaphor. Remember, if you don't, remember um, that at the time of Jesus and really throughout most of the Old Testament, from Moses to Jesus, um, there is one place on earth where God is understood to, to abide in a unique and physical way, right? And, and, and that's the tabernacle and, the, and then later what becomes the temple, right? And so, at the time of Jesus, and really, again, throughout the whole Old Testament, if you want to encounter the presence of God, there's only one place you can go. This is not like other religions. Other religions, you can have a temple to Zeus in every city. In fact, you can have a temple to Zeus in every city and a temple to Hera in every city and all you want. Um, but in Scripture, you cannot have a temple to Yahweh in every city. You can't even have multiple temples. There is one, and it's in Jerusalem. And it's the only place you can go to encounter the presence of God. Part of the reason Jesus is in the temple all the time, right? So then you come to 1 Corinthians, and, and Paul has this unbelievable metaphor. He says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body. So, do me a favor. Look around this room for a minute. It's really pretty, right? We got the great wood ceilings. We got the big cross. We got the stone communion table, baptismal font. It's really a pretty room. But what Paul is saying is that you are a more holy place than this room. Paul is saying that all the cathedrals and the monasteries in the world that have ever made or been made or will be made cannot contain God the same way that your arms and legs and head and torso can. Paul is saying that the reason we don't need to rebuild the temple, which was the center of our worship for 1,500 years, is because we upgraded from the temple to you, that now your body is that place where God's Spirit chooses to dwell, where the world gets to encounter the presence of God. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was pretty cool when we were the bridge between the, the spiritual world and the physical world, but now Paul says, you're not just the bridge between the spiritual and the physical, now you bring God everywhere you go. 
that there are no physical acts that don't also involve the presence of God because God dwells in you. That's incredible and also kind of intense, right? That, that whatever I do with my body, wherever I go with my body, God is there and is in me and is with me. What would happen if we started thinking about ourselves this way? What would happen if we started thinking about our identity and our bodies um, not just as that place, the spirits in the material world, I'm temporary, temporary holding tank, um, but instead, no, God has descended into me and asks me to carry Him everywhere else I go. Well, um, I might treat my temple differently. Right? Uh, I wouldn't write on the walls and crayon in this room, and I wouldn't leave trash on the floor, and I wouldn't spill coffee on the carpet, um, and so I shouldn't do that in my temple. Right? Uh, and, and I hope that the world will come and, and meet Jesus. And I hope they come into this room and do that. And so I hope they'll come uh, to my life and in my life they'll meet Jesus too. And you know what? This room isn't perfect. Um, you probably can't see them now, but there are these little cracks in the plaster that have been driving me crazy and, and Dave Nitzel's been helping me fix the plaster. Um, and, and there's more than just that, all kinds of little imperfections in this room. Does it matter? Not at all. Does it keep you from encountering God? Not at all. There are a host of imperfections in you too, right? and none of them keep people from meeting Jesus in you. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do today. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, to, to think two thoughts, and to do this, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. So just close your eyes and, uh, and think two thoughts with me. Here's the first question I want to ask you. Um, what is it in your life and in your body um, that you are unhappy about? What part of your body do you need to see with eyes like Jesus today? Uh, the part of you that uh, you want to cover up or are ashamed about. Um, and, and can you, even right now, even in this moment, can you say, God, I want to give that over to you. I want to recognize uh, that that thing, whatever it might be, should have no power over me because the beauty of myself is not rooted and those little details, it's in my role as, as your bridge and your temple. Can you do that? Just, just think for a minute about um, what that one thing might be, or maybe there's more than one thing you don't like about yourself and about your body, and give it over to God right now. And then I want you to ask the second question, God, uh, is, there, is there some way in my life right now where I am using your temple in ways that I would never use this sanctuary? God, is there something in my life that I need to change or cut out or start up um, because I'm going to take seriously my identity as your temple, as the place where your spirit dwells? And um, that thing might not be something you can fix this moment. Right? That thing might be something that uh, you've got to work on fixing, uh, and maybe it's a matter of, of saying, God, just help me have the courage to ask the first person I need to ask for help on this journey. Okay, uh, you, you, can, you can open your eyes. Um, I think the, the, the key for us today as we think about our bodies and our identity is really quite simple, right? That, um, that the part of yourself you're least satisfied with, God loves. Uh, that uh, the part of yourself you'd like to pretend isn't really you, really is you. Um, and that um, both Madonna and the police are wrong, right? You, you are not material girls and you are not spirits in a material world. Uh, you are a bridge between the spiritual and the physical worlds that God made. You are a temple where the world comes to meet God. Your body is part of who you are and it is good. Thanks be to Him. Amen.
Please be seated. <clears throat> As we come together in prayer this morning, I want to lift up some concerns for our family of faith. Uh, we had a number of folks in our family who lost uh, loved ones and their extended family this week. Uh, so I want to ask for prayers for Drew Boucher's family at the passing of his uncle Tom and for uh, Mary Joswiak's family at the passing of her sister Peggy and for Marcy Fairman's family at the passing of her sister Faith. Uh, and we ask that God's um, promise of resurrection hope would surround each one of those families this week. Uh, also, I uh, want to give thanks to God for a new family in our midst. So um, we had the privilege on Wednesday night of greeting our um, the refugee family that our church is helping to sponsor in Wausau, and that's the Masum family. I think we have a picture. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, a ton of people from our church, plus the family in the very center. Uh, they have two sweet little children who are, I think, ages three and one. And uh, so we're very grateful that they are here and safe in their new apartment, and we'll be praying for them in the coming weeks and months. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are reminded today of the incredible promise uh, that You designed us, that You delighted in us, and that You have called us uh, in our bodies to this incredible purpose of, uh, of exhibiting You to the world. We pray, Holy Spirit, that You would come and dwell in us today. Uh, we pray, Lord, that our bodies might be used as Your temples, and, and we pray, Lord, that You would give us that uh, internal commitment to honor our temples well uh, and to recognize that our bodies are good uh, and to be used for good things. We thank You for the incredible promise of our Savior Jesus that, uh, that He bought us um, at the cost of His body and His life on the cross. And we thank You, Lord, for the promise that one day He will return and bring us back to the fullness of life, uh, resurrected uh, in bodies again to live forever with You. And we pray, Lord, uh, that as we wait for that day, You would allow us uh, to, to see that hope, uh, even for those who are mourning this week, even those who are mourning uh, family members they have lost. God, give them that hope that there is a resurrection that is to come. We thank You for uh, bringing the Masum fam Mashum family to our community, and we ask, Lord, Your blessings on them as they acclimate to this place. Show us how to be good witnesses to them of Your love and grace. And we pray, Lord, that this week uh, You would infuse Yourself so deeply in our bodies and in our minds and in our hearts and in our souls uh, that we identify ourselves not as your creation, but as your children. And as your children, we offer to you the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, I'm going to invite um, uh, Barb and Glenn Lamping up for just a minute, um, and I asked if Barb and Glenn would come and share with you all a little bit about our endowment. So um, we have this goal of um, periodically reminding you that we have an endowment, which is kind of a new thing for our church. And um, I asked Barb and Glenn to come share because they're a family in our church that has decided to include the church in their in, uh, estate planning and, and the endowment in their estate planning. And so I just wanted to ask why. Uh, and so, um, Barb, I'd let you share first, maybe. Okay. For us, the giving decision to give towards the endowment fund is tied very heavily in our belief in tithing. And um, tithing was ingrained in me growing up. My parents taught me from a very young age that whatever we earned was a gift from God and that we needed to give back 10%. So, and my parents modeled this behavior in every way. And so if I made $5 babysitting or if I got $5 in a birthday card, 50 cents went to church or went to a charity. So that, that gave me an example to follow. And so 
we ca I carried that and Glenn carried that into our adulthood. And we've been reminded in numerous ways of how God blesses our giving and he honors when we listen to his voice. An example of this is a number of years ago when I was still married to my ex-husband and my giving to charities had caused stress and it, he did not agree with my level of giving. And I continued to do what, what I felt God was calling me to do. And it was towards November, December, when you always have a lot of extra things come up. You know, I had a friend ask me for a missionary that needed some help that was in Guatemala. And then another person for Croatia. And then came the Thanksgiving food baskets for the needy in the Tulsa community. And then came, well, we need funds to decorate our church for the Christmas season. So I was concerned about giving to these, but I prayed about it. And I did what I felt the Holy Spirit was telling my heart to do. And what happened was within a few weeks, I received an unexpected monetary award that was 10 times those extra amounts that I had given. And we continue to be reminded that God, you can't outgive God, mm. and that he will bless you in ways you have no idea. Mm. Okay. And now I'll let Glenn speak to how that's led to the endowment fund. Um, both Barb and I recognize that at our uh, baptisms, it was our call to serve God's kingdom. And in making a legacy gift to our endowment fund, it for us was truly an expression of our gratitude and our thanksgiving to God's gifts that he has given to us. Um, we believe that it also demonstrates that those things that God has given to us throughout our life, we're not owners of that. We are simply stewards of that. And that while we have the opportunity to serve God's kingdom, leaving a, a legacy gift to the endowment fund, simply put, is a way for us to continue the mission of the church and to, to extend service to God's kingdom. It's not a matter of how much you give, but it's the intention in our hearts to give to God's kingdom. And I've had the privilege of being able to serve for many years as a deacon and now as an elder, and I feel that I need to lead by example. So. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate um, your reflection and your generosity, but also your willingness to get up and, and share um, where that comes from. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. If you'd like to learn more about our endowment um, and how you can make a, a legacy gift to that, you can talk probably with Glenn and Barb afterwards or me or Ashley Howley or um, we'd love to help you answer those questions or just call the church anytime. Um, boy, Barb also talked about tithes, which is awesome because it's a great segue into our offering. So um, we now have the privilege of giving back to God some of what He's given us, uh, the first fruits and our tithes and offerings. And so um, we invite you online, do that right on our website, in person. You can drop those gifts in the offering plate as you exit the church at the end of our service. Um, during this time, you can also take a minute and fill out your connection card. Please let us know that you're here. That's a big help for us. And on the back of that card, if you have a need for prayer, we would love the privilege of being in prayer for you. You can share that prayer request right on your card. We'll pray for you after the service. Uh, we invite you to reflect on your giving and on your cards and your prayers as we continue to worship. Searching every day in 
messed up something new. But I have found a living way, the paths of treasures true. The way of gladness, I've discovered the way of joy, I've discovered relief from sadness, tis a happiness without alloy, I've discovered the fount of blessing, I've discovered the living word, was the greatest of all. Eternal life so fair, twas in the Savior's sacrifice I found this jewel rare. I've discovered the way of gladness, I've discovered the way of joy, I've discovered relief from sadness. Is a happiness without a Lord. I've discovered the fount of blessing. I've discovered the living word. Twas the greatest of all discoveries. When I found Jesus, my All right, some reminders for you as you go out this week. I want to remind you that next Sunday after church is our congregational meeting where we elect elders and deacons and do my terms of call and hear our annual report. Uh, and so if you're a member, we hope you'll be back and, and join us for that next week. If you're worshiping with us online, you can join us via Zoom for that congregational meeting as well after church next Sunday. Uh, if you're not a member of our church, uh, then instead of doing that next Sunday, you ought to come to our uh, new member class next Sunday, CCPC 101, which will also happen right after worship in Bolden Hall in the conference room. And it's a chance to learn more about who we are as a, as a congregation and, and what it might mean to be involved in our family of faith. Uh, also want to remind you, uh, the auction is coming up fast, save the date, blah, blah, blah. And also want to remind you uh, that we're um, still taking reservations for our South Dakota mission trip, so I hope you'll consider uh, perhaps joining us on that um, mission and adventure as well. Now, sisters and brothers, I pray as you go about your week this week, you would be mindful of the awesome responsibility you have of being the temple in which God's presence dwells. And I pray you'd remember uh, that your body is you and God made you good. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>